Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever in the world you may be joining us from today. My name is Francesco Del Carpio, and I am the CIFA York Operations Coordinator. I would like to officially open the fourth session of our Climate Change and Global Occupational Health and Safety Speaker Series in partnership with the Restore Lab at the University of Toronto, the Datalate Institute for Global Health Research, and the Global Labor Research Center with the Land Acknowledgement. We acknowledge and recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territory upon which our campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. The area is known as Tukaranto and has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and that the territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. As this is an online event, our participants may be joining from various locations, so I strongly encourage you to learn about the traditional land upon which you are located. With this, I welcome our moderator, our speaker, and our participants from around the world. Welcome to the webinar. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Byamkesh Talukdar. Dr. Byamkesh Talukdar is the inaugural Planetary Health Fellow at the Data Lake Adelaide Institute for Global Health Research at York University, where he works at the intersection of health, sustainable development, climate change, food, and agriculture. He will be working with the faculties of health and environmental studies to develop health indicators associated with the ecological footprint. Dr. Talekter will also be working as on modeling the health impacts of climate change related extreme weather events. His past research applies a complexity science approach to designing sustainability assessment models of food and agricultural systems in Bangladesh. Dr. Talekdar also has over 15 years of interdisciplinary field and training experience, including the supervision of over 2,000 emerging leaders in sustainable development programs and policy design in Bangladesh. Since 2016, he has been a Mitex postdoctoral fellow at Parmalat Canada and the Desatilis Factor. Faculty of Management at McGill University. Dr. Talekter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for moderating today. Yeah, uh -huh. thank you very much, uh, uh, Francisco, for your introduction. Um, I am working as a moderator today, and I welcome you all to the um, Climate Change Global Occupational Health and uh, Safety Speaker Series, um, uh, Session 4 on Climate Governance through Global Health Diplomacy and Climate Diplomacy. Today, we have with us a distinguished speaker, Dr. Vijay Kumar Chattu. Dr. Vijay Kumar Chattu is a global health physician specialized in global health governance, global health diplomacy, and global health security. Dr. Vijay did his MBBS and MD in community medicine from MGIMS, uh, Shogram, MPAs in health policy and management from Belgium, MP, MPhil in Global Health Governance from South Africa and his PhD thesis in International Relations focus on global health security and global health diplomacy. Besides, he did a specialization certificate on global health diplomacy from the Graduate Institute Geneva and a diploma in global health diplomacy. From NOVA Institute of Lisbon, Dr. Satu recently completed a two years fellowship in occupational medicine at the University of Toronto is also identified as one of the researchers in sustainability at the University of Toronto, considering his exceptional work. Besides, he has, he has an excellent track of over 300 research publications and has been ranked consistently among the world's top 2% scientists in public health by Stanford University ranking in 2022 and 2021. As a global health policy advisor, he contributes to the T20 policy brief for the G20 summit and also provides consultancy of multilateral such as World Bank, UNH, and WHO. Mr. Chatu also served as a, a go, uh, governance co lead for the Climate Climate Health Network hosted by United Nations University, Belgium, Ghent, and also Ghent University. His interdisciplinary research in medicine, health, economics, and social science focus on strengthening human security and development. Welcome you, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Vijay Kumar. Um, you have uh, 40 minutes. This is actually housekeeping. And then after 40 minutes, we have eight minutes for um, uh, question and answer session. And then we have two minutes for recap. So the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar. Thank you very much, Dr. Talukdar. And uh, 
I think, you know, uh, people uh, who have attended last time, I think most of them know me. So uh, I'm not going into details about my background here. Uh, can you please allow me to share the screen? Uh, yeah, Francisco, can you do that, please? Yeah, you should have access to share now. Sorry about that. Right. Okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the participants who have joined. I really appreciate your time and uh, for joining this session. And in continuation with my previous session, uh, I would like to continue with the climate governance through global health diplomacy and climate diplomacy. Uh, in a way, this is a very uh, complicated topic because each domain or you know each aspect of this title itself has three major parts. One is climate governance, global health diplomacy, and climate diplomacy. So uh, before I get into the presentation, I would like to disclose the relationships and financial uh, commitments or uh, the honorarium I received from various organizations, my affiliations with, and also uh, royalties I get from various publishers. So, and also I want to declare that, you know, I don't have any conflict of interest. And also I acknowledge all the online sources that have been um, uh, used for the presentation, especially the clip arts and the photographs. And also I want to mention that, you know, the information that I've provided is evidence-based, uh, which are basically uh, recommendations from various policy documents. And also uh, they are peer reviewed, most if I'm using the papers, they're all peer reviewed articles. So in that way, um, there are no other uh, biases. So coming back to the, coming to the learning objectives, uh, this presentation actually I have divided into three uh, objectives basically. So each objective addresses, uh, one one section of the presentation. Uh, so the first one is about uh, learning about climate governance. Uh, and this part actually I have uh, slightly, um, mm, well, you know, uh, it is not complicated, but you know, I tried to address in a stepwise manner. So you'll find that the presentation is slightly around 20, more than half of the presentation will be covered by the climate governance. And the rest of the two objectives, I think I'll cover in another, uh, 20 minutes time. So the second objective we are talking about uh, the concepts of global health diplomacy and climate diplomacy. And third one, we'll try to link how these diplomacies are actually enabling or also strengthening the uh, global uh, climate governance. So I would like to just give us a little background about this. So in the last seminar, we discussed more about the focus on occupational health impacts and how the global health governance is working. Uh, but in this presentation, we are trying to uh, tackle or address, you know, the wider uh, global health impacts such as, you know, um, the floods or, you know, the wildfires or, you know, the hurricanes, the drought situation, so the food security and all these uh, actions. So, and there is also uh, climate migration. The other impact aspect, uh, important aspect is that the migration actually, which is very global, because there is a movement of people uh, from one state to other state or one, one, one country to another country. And sometimes they move the continent as well, either on a temporary basis or permanently. So this actually uh, leads to a big global crisis situation. And uh, that is also something uh, very important when we consider for the uh, climate governance. And the second aspect is climate emergency. This is a term which is actually used during the protests against the climate change. And declaring climate emergency is an action taken by the governments just to acknowledge that the humanity is in crisis. So uh, since 2016, as you can see here, uh, there are 1,900 local governments in 34 countries which have actually announced as climate emergencies. Even in uh, even the European Parliament declared climate emergency in November 20, uh, 2019. So this clearly uh, uh, indicates how it is important uh, to have a global climate governance because you know it is trying because this is a phenomenon at global level linking so many domains. 
So coming to the first objective, uh, in this objective, we'll try to define what is climate governance and also understand what are the various aspects that are involved in this complex mechanism. So uh, we, we understand right now, I mean, you know, with the previous sessions which you have participated, you know, it gives a clear indication that, you know, the climate crisis has a uh, potential actually to uh, significantly impact on the societies, on human lives, on workspaces. And also uh, it undermines the human security uh, because, you know, again, when we talk about human security, it's about uh, personal security, it's about human rights, it's about food security, it's about political security. So it has all these dimensions. And also, therefore, you know, it, it, it has a potential even to increase the risks of conflict and instability among nations. So uh, climate governance uh, can be defined. Uh, there may be many definitions, but you know, uh, this is the most widely accepted or you know, this uh, coming from the United Nations, which says that it's a continuous process of discussions and negotiations involving a diverse group of national and local governments, international organizations, the private sector, NGOs, and other social actors. So if you look at this, uh, I mean, the stakeholders or the components, literally everyone is there in this. So again, you know, as we discussed in the last seminar about global health the governance, the same again, you know, you see that it is the climate governance also a multi-level, it's a multi-stakeholder and multidisciplinary involving varying disciplines and professionals. So this is a graphic representation uh, and it shows the climate governance between various levels. So as you can see on left side, you have the governments, international bodies, NGOs and private sector and other social actors, including uh, small uh, community groups maybe, or you know the social media and all. And you see the gray color, it, it is an arrow mark that is actually, you know, it, it's showing a relation between these uh, parties and also acting at different levels. So you see the different levels at local, national, and global. So, and there are, these interactions are bi-directional and they are also like complex in the sense that there are formal negotiations at the same time there are informal discussions. So what is the advantage or what are the advantages of this multi-level climate governance? So as we have seen, you know, whenever you have more stakeholders, when you have different levels of, uh, subnational, national, international, and global, the mechanism or the communication or anything, even financing system, it becomes so complex. So you need kind of coherence. So I think, you know, through this climate governance, you know, now we try to bring the coherence, collaboration, and also the integration, basically, you know, how these actors are working together for a common goal and, you know, what are their strengths, identify their strengths and weaknesses, and try to complement wherever that is possible. So through that, actually, I think, you know, this multi-stakeholder par partnership can be a very effective way. And the other advantages can be, uh, you can establish uh, proper objectives uh, and the mechanisms and the policies exactly to address what are the current situations according to the uh, country or, you know, specific to the need. So there, and also this mechanism will help to develop tools for decision making, for evaluation and follow up and also to even among the stakeholders you know they they you can strengthen the collaboration and also you know share the responsibilities and relationships so in that way the multi level climate governance uh, is shown to be an effective tool or you know there's the only effective way uh, to do uh, to or to manage uh, this uh, climate impacts at global level through the governance so in this governance, what happens is basically, you know, you have the negotiation process that happens. And most of these high level negotiations takes place in the UNFCCC, uh, which is basically United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So, you know, we will use this UNFCCC often in this uh, presentation. So basically this is the high level body. And uh, also you'll have the negotiation happening as I shown in the picture between the national uh, and international actors. And these negotiations can also happen, as I mentioned, you know, either through the bilateral meetings between two parties, because, you know, uh, two parties means here, basically two countries, most of the time in our, our language here. And uh, also you can have, you know, uh, partnerships or, you know, you can have meetings, uh, let's say, you know, um, 
between these bodies, you know, uh, among uh, various stakeholders. And also sometimes, you know, when you have a big um, uh, summit, again, you can, the summit can be uh, represented by various head of the states, and there also you can have this negotiation process happening. Therefore, the process takes place uh, at all levels, and that's why uh, it becomes a co complex matrix. As a result of these uh, uh, negotiations, actually, you know, uh, they result in some kind of legal instruments. Some may be binding, some may be non-binding. Where, you know, uh, for example, the the Earth Summit, uh, which uh, in 1992 actually it has resulted in the UNFCCC. And later, you know, the under the UNFCC, you had the Kyoto Protocol in 2020, uh, uh, and also, uh, sorry, uh, Paris Agreement, you know, which happened in uh, 2016. And actually, this Paris Agreement uh, made a record because on a single day, you had 175 leaders uh, signing the treaty on the same day. Apart from this, so, you know, you have the legal instruments, you have the uh, negotiations, now we'll talk about the what are the global bodies uh, or what are the stakeholders, main stakeholders or the institutions that that play a key role in this negotiations. So you have the conference of the parties to the UNFCCC. Basically, these are all the member countries of the world. Each one is represented by the head of state, and you know, so each party is represented by uh, or you know, each party is a country. So you have the conference of parties. And you have the conference of parties who are actually uh, uh, serving as a meeting of the parties of the Paris Agreement because only uh, 175 countries signed this agreement. Uh, so, you know, you have some people who have joined the Paris Agreement. So all the countries that joined that have signed the Paris Agreement are part of this conference of parties. Then you have the Bureau, which is made up of country representatives assigned by the five regions uh, geographically. And, you know, they provide the advice and the guidance on the work of UNFCCC. In continuation with the institutions, you have other institutions like subsidiary body for scientific and technological advice, which advises the climate science, environment, and technology matters. Then you have subsidiary body for implementation. Basically, they support the implementation of the uh, um, results of UNFCCC. Uh, and finally, the secretariat, which is a main provider of technical and administrative support for the UNFCCC. And there is another independent body called as Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is not part of UNFCCC, but it's a UN body, which con consists of scientists and technical experts, basically, who represent the whole world. And they talk and, you know, they advise on like the scientific advice for the way forward, how countries have to react or what are the projections and how, what are the uh, steps that need to be taken at, uh, to address that crisis. And again, you know, you this is again divided into three working groups. Group one talks about or they focus on physical signs of climate change. Group two talks about the impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. And group three on mitigation of climate change. And also you have constituted bodies. Uh, like I said, you know, the framework of uh, um, UNFCCC, the Kyoto Protocol and Paris Agreement were formed. And these uh, protocols or agreements, actually, they promote and facilitate a dialogue on different issues. And actually, you have various bodies. There are around 15 bodies, but I have just listed a few here. One is the Adaptation Committee, Standing Committee on Finance, Global Environment Facility, Green, Green Climate Fund, Technology Executive Committee. So there are other committees and facilities uh, which are not listed here. But you know, basically, I wanted to highlight that it is a very, uh, it includes so many stakeholders and so many Wisconsin bodies are uh, making it so complex. And besides, it's very important not having bodies, I mean, you know, having good number of representation is not enough, you need funding. So I think, you know, there must be a funding structure. And I think, you know, uh, the UNFCCC has a very clear financial mechanisms here. And uh, the, the, whatever resources that come from are contributed by the developed countries and the regional blocks, I think, you know, they apply according to the what the Paris Agreement goals are or what the Kyoto Protocol says. In a way, you know, uh, they address as per the crisis situation and the emergency. And now you have the members of climate change negotiations. So as I said, in UNFCCC, each party is a country. So, you know, you have all the countries representing that and they take part in these negotiations. And 
you can see um, some countries, for example, you know, uh, they are not contributing in terms of CO2 emissions that much, but then, you know, they are suffering the impacts of climate change. So, you know, there are always discussions like this. We didn't contribute much. The rich nations have contributed or, you know, wherever the developmental activities are happening, they are contributing. So there's a fight between the global South and global North. And, you know, again, you know, through negotiations, you have to come up with a agenda, how to address that. So again, you know, as I mentioned, these are the five regional groups, Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Caribbean, Central and Eastern Europe, and the Western Europe. Besides, you also have observers, meaning, you know, they don't take part or, you know, they don't uh, give any uh, involved in the uh, documentation or, you know, in kind, kind of, you know, giving a, a rule-based order. They, they, they are like observers. So, you know, some of them are like, they're not the technical bodies, but, you know, they are observers. They can be staff from the General Secretariat, United Nations organizations, intergovernmental organizations, non-governmental organizations. Here in the inter intergovernmental organizations, you know, yeah, I meant to say it's not just the UN bodies, but you know, you have the European Commission, you have the African Union, you have, uh, you know, for example, bodies like uh, NATO or you know, uh, ADB, African Development Bank, and all that. So you know, these are different other the. Uh, other intergovernmental organizations like CARICOM. So, you know, uh, and also the NGOs, of course, you know, all the civil society representation, the organizations that work for climate and all that. And other than that, the other NGOs is a big list. Now, if you can see, again, these NGOs are grouped into different subcategories according to their uh, structure and their policies or their mission and vision. So if you see, you have the bingos here, that is a business and industry NGOs. You have the trade union NGOs. You have the women and gender constituency. You have environmental NGOs. So, you know, you have uh, NGOs representing the indigenous people and you have farmers. So, and these groups, I think, you know, they, they have more voice now. And because of that, I think, you know, uh, they could be able to this advocacy by these people or these groups. I think, you know, the countries are actually uh, in a way listening to some of the uh, burning issues. So where do this happen? Do you, as part of this, you know, you have these negotiations. There are different spaces. You know, it's not always happening in the main uh, room, like, you know, in the UN uh, committees or anything. But, you know, sometimes, you know, you have the plenaries, wherever, you know, there's a UNFCC conference you have, you know, uh, during that you can have, you have informal groups where people meet and, you know, then they discuss about their agenda, their burning issues. And, you know, I think if there's a good partnership or with the, there is good diplomacy happening, I think, you know, uh, it can result in some changes and next steps uh, for, to take the next steps forward. So um, in regards to uh, other, other venues, you know, you can have the sidebars, you know, especially during, you know, uh, side events, especially when, uh, uh, for example, the World Health Assembly is happening now and, you know, there are many side events happening. So uh, that can be a forum again, you know, to meet with the NGO partners or with your uh, country partners or the regional associations or professional bodies. In that way, you can, uh, depending upon, you know, your agenda, your national agenda, you can also have your agreements bilaterally or, you know, as, a, uh, as part of the summit. Uh, then, you know, basically, uh, you need to communicate this, whatever that happened, you know, you need to communicate to your audience, because at the end of the day, the, you have to communicate to the citizens, because, again, you know, uh, the all whole targets of United Nations or, you know, or any government is basically to ensure sustainability, addressing the challenges for the health security and human security. So that way, you know, they make sure that, you know, um, uh, the discussion that happened on these forums are actually shared to uh, the community. So this gives a brief idea about you know, how the climate governance, what are the structures, uh, what are the stakeholders, and how it happens, how the negotiation takes place, and what are the different constituent bodies and all that. So with this uh, uh, little information, because you know this this is a very wide topic, but you know I tried to summarize uh, you know uh, in a because I had to fit everything in 40 minutes. So I took like 20, 20, so, you know. Now we'll try to discuss more about the global health diplomacy and climate diplomacy. So as I mentioned, like global health governance, even global health diplomacy is also multidisciplinary. So now we got a sense of what is multidisciplinary thing, what is multi-level and what is multi-stakeholders and all that. So 
now you know in global health diplomacy you can see people are uh, who have knowledge or you know who are involved in all the domains who practice in different domains but then you know they apply their skills uh, to better address these challenges and most of the uh, health challenges we will see here that you know they are either caused from the infectious diseases or chronic diseases as a result of our lifestyle but again you know you have most of them coming from the climate change impacts so there are different definitions uh, uh, for global health diplomacy as you can see and uh, as I mentioned, you know, these are the three main uh, health threats right now for the globe. One is the epidemics and pandemics, the non-communicable diseases, and the climate change. And climate change also has an impact on the pandemics and infectious diseases. So in a way, you know, um, even non-communicable diseases, because when the food security, uh, when the food crisis and all these things happen, again, you know, it results to malnutrition, it results to poverty and all that. So that way, you know, what happens is it's a chain of events which links all the sustainable development goals and they're again interlinked. So to address this again, you know, you need uh, the do uh, domain expertise from all these multiple stakeholders. So this is one of my, uh, one of the flow charts, you know, which I used in my research and I'm trying to share here. Basically, here, you know, you will see the importance of uh, the crisis situations and how global health diplomacy can actually intervene and provide uh, the required steps. So, for example, if there's any pandemic or any security crisis, it can actually, I mean, you know, it will result in destruction of infrastructure, it will increase uh, mortality, morbidities, increase in dis uh, displacement camps, rise in migration and economic crisis. So, all these things will happen in any of a disaster or anything. So, what happens is basically your public health problems will increase. At the same time, there's a great demand for international cooperation and support from other donor agencies or countries who can help that particular nation to come out of the crisis. And but through the negotiations uh, through health diplomacy, again, you, know, you can apply, you can use the various international norms or you know, various uh, protocols that are uh, agreements that are already um, agreed by the parties, by the countries, in order to, you know, by doing that, you know, you can improve the access, you can increase the financing or funding mechanisms, and you can also mobilize the resources from a nation which has those resources. And at the same time, you know, uh, the humanitarian assistance is all can also be provided through all these partnerships. So that way, you know, we can see global health diplomacy playing a very critical role, and it applies to uh, a climate change crisis. It can be, uh, let's say, a hurricane, an earthquake, or anything. So we can see now, you know, global health diplomacy can actually, you know, it is, it can be used for negotiation, it can be used for establishing new governance mechanisms, it can build partnerships and improve, strengthen the stakeholder relations, it can create alliances in support of health and well-being outcomes, it responds to public health crisis as we discussed now, and it improves the relations because you see, uh, global health diplomacy can also be a tool of peace. And, you know, uh, we have seen that, you know, how health can actually uh, can liaise or, you know, it can link so many domains and, you know, it also contributes to peace, security and human development. So in that way, global health diplomacy has a, a greater scope, much broader scope. Now let's talk about climate diplomacy. So the same way as we discussed for uh, global health diplomacy, climate diplomacy is also a multidisciplinary and multi-stakeholder thing. And according to the, uh, there is no fixed or, you know, a gold standard definition for climate diplomacy, but the one uh, used by European Union, I think, you know, it has four pillars. One, it emphasizes on committing to multilateralism in climate policy, uh, particularly to the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And secondly, it talks about addressing implications of climate change on peace and security. Third one is on accelerating domestic action and raising global ambition. And finally, enhancing international climate cooperation through advocacy and outreach. So if you see this terminology here, again, you know, there is an overlap with the global health diplomacy and uh, climate diplomacy. In the sense, you know, the main aim at the end is to promote peace and development, to strengthen the partnerships, to work together, and to uh, uh, respect the mutual partnerships. So in that way, I think, you know, climate diplomacy and global health diplomacy, I think, you know, they are like, uh, they are synergistic to each other. They are not in competition, but, you know, they are together and together they can make a very bigger impact. And that is what I think, you know, through this presentation, 
we should be able to appreciate at the end. So as we know, the climate crisis is a global issue and it touches, you know, different areas, you know, on international and foreign policy. It's not just a rise in global temperature or, you know, earthquakes or anything, but it's more of the food security. It's more of the human security dimensions. And besides, you know, it also touches the international politics, the geopolitical aspects, for example, the sovereignty of a nation, territorial integrity and access to resources such as water, food and energy. We see a lot of uh, fight between nations in sharing their water or energy and all that. So I think, you know, again, it has a very wider implication than what we think. Uh, because most of the times, you know, we are specialized in one area and we try to focus, we look, we try to look within our domain and, you know, we, but once we try to see beyond, I think, you know, we see a lot of wider ramifications. So um, climate diplomacy encompasses all diplomatic engagement relating to climate change by reaching out to partner countries bilaterally for more ambitious climate action. So, you know, we can have these agreements, we can have this uh, uh, global, uh, you know, binding instruments or non-binding instruments, but at the same time, uh, through bilateral agreements, actually, you can do much more because, you know, when you have that kind of stronger partnerships where uh, you can get the financial security or the uh, standard protocols or the guidance from a country that has experience, I think the other one can also do much better. If you look at different milestones in climate diplomacy, um, uh, this is from the European uh, Commission perspective and, you know, you can see a list of things happening for the uh, during the past two decades now. So there was the first EU report uh, uh, in 2008 on climate change and international security, followed by uh, you know the EU Council conclusions on climate diplomacy. Then there was a lead by Germany in the UNSC and putting forward the importance of climate diplomacy and how the impacts of climate change are going to have on the world and all that. So then you know again you have a, a new climate for peace. Uh, you know, which was commissioned by the G7 in 2015. And over the years now, again, you know, in 2020, again, Germany in the UNSC has highlighted about uh, the importance of climate change. So you can see the climate diplomacy uh, has a track uh, of, you know, influencing the global agenda, uh, increasing the partnerships, increasing the, you know, the financing mechanisms or, you know, uh, benefiting the other countries in a way. But of course, you know, these negotiations keep on going and, you know, uh, they have to take place regularly in order to maintain that momentum in order to strengthen the partnerships. So if you look at different stakeholders here, I think, you know, and again, you know, I have listed a few, but, you know, there can be many more. So basically you have various governments and uh, intergovernmental organizations, private, civil society and everything, all the uh, stakeholders which I have discussed before. Then you have the professionals because you know it is multidisciplinary. You have professionals from technology, health, foreign policy, law, and everything. And the venues can be, like I said, for you know embassies, especially when you have the bilateral, or you know you can have you know uh, an office like you know U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator on Health Diplomacy in the U.S. You can have other forums like you know uh, UNGA, World Health Assembly, G7, G20, and all that. So again, you know. Uh, this complex mechanism, all these things are happening. Whenever you're having an event, you it is not just uh, climate governance or global health governance happening. I think, you know, it is shaping the environment for diplomacy, for governance, for both health, for climate. So, you know, uh, it's a complex mechanism happening every time. So now we can understand like, you know, the influence of global health diplomacy and climate diplomacy. And through their partnerships, through their unique strengths and their unique partnerships, how they can actually create an environment uh, for effective governance. So I come to the objective three, where now we'll try to highlight the roles of these uh, global health diplomacy and climate diplomacy for the climate governance. So we are trying to address these three domains now. We try to link it together so that it makes more sense now. So we have seen uh, what this GHD and climate diplomacy are there, uh, what they are. And, uh, you know, looking at that, you know, strategically, you know, they, you need a more coordinated response at global level. And that doesn't mean only working at global level, you have national and subnational level as well. Uh, so, you know, it has to go uh, step by step uh, with, you know, mutual uh, uh, engagement in that way uh, to ensure that, you know, the agenda from the bottom is carried to the top. 
because you know most of these problems are coming from the countries and you know i think it has there must be community participation and it should be a felt need in that way and uh, these both these uh, uh, diplomacies basically you know through their negotiations they try to help the societies to strengthen them to address the uh, human security challenges and in a form, uh, if you look at both of them, basically, you know, they are more like a preventive diplomacy in the sense, you know, before some crisis happens, you know, they are trying to ensure, okay, take an action for this, develop or create a fund for this so that, you know, we can prevent this. So, you know, in a way, you know, both of them are complementary to each other. And at the same time, you know, uh, they are uh, actually, they are addressing the challenges posed by the climate change. For example, uh, you see the sustainable development goals again, you know, uh, I, I highlighted this in my last uh, talk, but again, you know, I'm trying to uh, highlight here again, because, you know, uh, we are going to talk because, you know, this again, this global diplomacy and climate diplomacy through that actually, you know, we are trying to link all this health domain, education, inequalities, whatever that are happening again, you know, with clim being climate sensitive and also preserving our oceans and forests. And, you know, this is all about how these diplomacies are actually working uh, to align them together so that, you know, there is not much duplication, but at the same time, you're not trying to use the expertise. So this is one of the uh, figures, you know, which I used in my research work. So you can see how global health diplomacy at uh, the steering wheel, trying to link the domains of health, peace, development. And outside these domains, you know, you have the climate action, which is sustainable development goal number 13. So, you know, uh, you can see health domain itself is trying to link all the sustainable development goals. At the same time, it has its impact. Anything that happens in climate has an impact on health. Anything you do to improve health will actually, you know, benefit everyone. So in that way, you know, global health diplomacy has, a, uh, has an excellent tool and, you know, it is useful for promoting various domains of health and development. And now we'll see uh, the other, how it impacted. Through this diplomacy, we have seen that, you know, uh, since 2013, the EU has identified climate change, uh, influence migration as a, as a health policy issue. So, you know, again, you know, we can see the importance of that, uh, how, you know, the a regional bloc and internal government organization has identified that. And SDG3 talks about promoting health, and you know, uh, you have the um, uh, the Lancet Migration, a European regional hub, which talk. I mean, you know, in that they talk about the accelerating research for climate change, influence migration, health. So we are talking about the climate change, migration, and health nexus. And again, you know, there, you know, you have the, a very uh, important role played by global health diplomacy and climate diplomacy in order to have effective policies and uh, stronger political high level commitments. The recent, you know, I just want to share the recent developments as a result of this in the uh, COP27 uh, in Egypt. So basically the five uh, top key uh, takeaways are establishing a dedicated fund for loss and damage. This is very important because uh, many groups are right now working for this loss and damage and maintaining a clear intention to keep 1.5 degree within the reach because they don't want to go beyond this as a global warming. And now holding businesses and institutions to account, because most of the time the private industry or the corporate, big corporates, you know, they they are trying to get a waiver or escape without getting contributing to the fund. So you know they want to hold these businesses because when they make money, they have to contribute as well. Then mobilizing more financial support for developing countries to ensure that you know there is equity uh, and you know uh, the only the developing countries should not just take the impacts of that and also making the pivot towards implementation. So it's not just talking, but again, you know, you have to implement all these uh, uh, policy discussions, whatever that happened. And uh, again, you know, do them, uh, do a follow-up in the next meet. So again, uh, I just wanted to highlight, even in COP26 uh, in Glasgow, I think, you know, uh, the Lancet migration co-hosted to high-level panel discussions. Again, why I'm talking is that, you know, uh, the climate change, migration, health nexus, again, it's a complicated nexus. And, you know, it, it also involves a lot of stakeholders and it's a big problem, uh, we, which we may be seeing in the near future as well. So, and also, you know, the UN system event was also organized in uh, November 2022, that is the health argument of climate action. So this shows that, you know, how 
uh, the diplomacies of global health and climate are actually framing these issues at a global agenda. So uh, that is how, uh, you know, I mean, uh, this is a, a sense of basically the importance of, you know, global health diplomacy and climate diplomacy. Uh, then again, you know, I just wanted to highlight that even at the World Trade Organization, for example, it's another intergovernmental organization. This talks about more of trade and business. But then even there, you know, they address the challenges of climate change for food safety, animal and planet, uh, plant health capacity. So this shows that again, you know, how uh, issue of health being taken at the business platforms. And that is through just because of this health diplomacy and climate diplomacy. So the discussions were also focusing on small island developing nations, which are hit particularly hard uh, by the impact of climate change. Uh, so there are other opportunities, like I said, you know, there is a One Health phenomenon which comes and, you know, uh, again, they address that One Health is a very good strategy to address uh, uh, in a way to address the challenges of uh, climate change. And there is a greater scope of uh, uh, the growing scope, basically, you know, with, through this global health diplomacy and climate diplomacy. And uh, even though the domain, especially they are emerging, but I think they have very synergic effect. Uh, so to conclude the presentation, I would like to say that you know, both this uh, global health diplomacy and climate diplomacy, they enable these multiple stakeholders to contribute to the greater health needs. They improve the partnerships, they improve the funding, they bring together, they bring the cohesion. So they do all kinds of synergistic actions. And also they bring in, especially scientifically, you know, they bring the policymakers, scientists and civil society to address these challenges. And uh, for example, you know, more discussion should be happening uh, and they will be happening even for the upcoming uh, COP28. Uh, and before I conclude that, you know, I would like to highlight uh, the UN Secretary General, uh, what he said during the COP27 that the world still needs a giant leap on climate ambition. So I think, you know, from every domain, from every partner, from every country, I think, you know, there is a lot to contribute and there is much more need to be done. So if someone is interested to follow on this uh, new uh, upcoming conferences in this domain, I think, you know, you can, there are some of them which I have listed. You can uh, you know, make a note of them, plan to attend in person or online if there is a facility. So now I think, you know, the world is looking forward for the COP28 and a lot of preparations are already happening. And I think, you know, through this, I think uh, I com I complete my presentation and uh, I thank you everyone for your attention and you know uh, and I look forward to questions and discussions now. So these are my references. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Bijoy. Uh, can you hear me, Dr. Bijoy? Yes. 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 Uh, it's a, a comprehensive presentation, and um, uh, many things is clear that what, what is global health um, uh, diplomacy and climate diplomacy and how they are interconnected. Uh, again, thank you very much for your comprehensive presentation. Now the floor is open for questions. So I will request uh, the participants. If you have any question, you can raise your hand and you can ask question to Dr. Vijo directly. So I think before you know, uh, getting question from the participants, I may ask a question, uh, Dr. Vijay. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, that this uh, climate change and global health uh, uh, diplomacy is very interrelated, uh, but there are also a lot of challenges, you know, uh, for the developing countries as well as also the developed countries uh, to bring them in their policies of, you know, uh, uh, health policies or addressing the global health. So what are the, you know, the, what are the mechanisms actually to overcome those challenges? Do you have any idea just to share with us? Well, I think, you know, if every country uh, understands or, you know, if it realizes, you know, uh, the way it is being a uh, victim or, you know, it is contributing to the uh, uh, climate change, I think, you know, there are certain steps that can be taken at national level through national policies. 
And the second thing is, you know, they can have, you know, health and all policies approach because, you know, before the uh, issue becomes a very major thing out of scope, I think, you know, countries can be, uh, well, you know, it needs a political commitment. It needs a lot of uh, uh, transformation within the nations because, you know, uh, there is nothing much that can actually be done at a very global level because you know, most of the things come within the countries. And, you know, there is a control when you are inside because, you know, national policies support that. The moment you come outside at a global platform, everyone, it's a blame game. Everyone will say, oh, I didn't do that much. You know, you develop, I mean, developed nations already. I mean, they burned the coal. They did everything before. No, now the developing countries will say, no, you did everything before you spoiled and now you're, uh, you know, making us to pay. So I think these discussions, negotiations, and these fights are happening every time. They will happen. They'll continue to happen. Uh, but the thing is, you know, even, for example, if you look at the supply chain systems, all the developing nations, they want the cheap labor. They want everything to be done from global south. And they pay the money, and they get the goods. And the countries in the global south will be burning the coal and doing all kinds of things. So you know, again, you know, now you measure the per capita CO2 emissions. But even if you look at the per capita CO2 emissions, US, Canada, they rank number one, number two, like that. So again, but you know, uh, if you look at the population, they will say, no, 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 China is the largest country or you, India is the largest country. So these discussions will happen, but I think, you know, we need to measure or, you know, there must be scientific evidence and we have that evidence. So let us use that logically. Like, you know, per capita emission of CO2 is really a good um, parameter to say like, you know, who is, which country is contributing how much, right? So uh, other aspects is like, you know, you can have good policy, like I said, you know, uh, if if you get into that debates, I think the political debates, you know, it will never end. But uh, from health perspective and as, a, you know, as researchers, what we can do is we can um, uh, sensitize our uh, national leaders or our directors through proper, you know, uh, negotiations and also through advocacy, how we can make our own space better through effective policies. So, you know, let us try to reduce wherever it is possible. We can replace with, you know, eco-friendly things. We can use the, we can give subsidies for solar. We can give, you know, uh, companies who are doing some good things. Let us give them some vouchers and encourage them to continue that way. So I think, you know, by doing those uh, uh, transformation or reforms, many things can be actually addressed within the country before they go to the global level. And once you try to implement them, now we have a success story to share at the global level that you see, we did this, we try to do this. Now we need support. Now we need funding for this in order to adhere or you know to implement what you want to say. Because it's always the rich nations, the, let's say the G7 or the developed countries talking, you do that, you do this. That kind of prescriptive thing won't work for climate change because you see, no one can dictate. The thing is, you know, uh, the issue is, we have, uh, you know, it's a complex mechanism, as I said, and uh, let us go with the evidence that is there and try to address them at applying the equity principle and having effective policies. You know, it is not a blame game, basically, because, you know, if even if someone is spoiling, everyone is getting the impact of that, right? So I think everyone has to work together, that there's no other way. Everyone has to work. No, I think you, you are rightly said, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Bijoy. I think is, uh, we have we have to take this holistic approach and also system thinking approach to address these very complex, uh, uh, you know, issues that we are facing right now. Uh, since I don't see uh, any questions, so I actually have another question. I think that at transboundary level, you know, collaboration is also uh, important before going to the global level. Since just take an example of uh, subcontinent: India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and China. So they, they have a problem of water sharing and then climate change is having impact on water sharing. And yeah. I, according to me, that is going to be a huge health concern in future through direct and indirect ways. I mean, through uh, the changing of the hydrological system as well as also the food security. So uh, how do you think that the, how uh, how it is important to start a transdisciplinary, transboundary collaborations to address the you know climate change related health issues and also bringing this diplomacy there because yeah. there is a lot of mistrust among those countries also. You know? <laughs> I don't know. I think you know you you led to a more political question actually. It is not so easy to answer that, but you know we have water diplomacy for that because it is so complex. There's a yeah. water diplomacy for that particular domain. But what I would say is, for example, you know it is not just be between India and Bangladesh. It actually comes from China. Because China is building many reservoirs and everything, they are blocking the water. So, you know, the Brahmaputra comes from there and, you know, it is having impact. So, you know, 
the nations actually they are looking more for their uh, nationalistic view they want to have everything they don't want to send to others so i think the natural course of the rivers are changed right these issues are between india china pakistan bangladesh they are in africa in ethiopia and the bordering countries so these things are there but i think you know this can be happened because if you look at the our southeast asia region currently there are many border issues so you know it is not just the water issue now it is a flare up it's a combination of things first of all you have a rivalry of uh, economy right you have a rivalry between let's say you know i can take the names like china india has this rivalry we have border issues with china right now you know now again the another partner pakistan or bangladesh who is there again you know now this geopolitical domains will play now someone will take one side now the two parties come to other side and now one has to take another action so i think you know it is a again a matrix it's not just water instead of water diplomacy being a medium to convey or you know make friendship now the border issues are there the trade issues are there and other geopolitical influence if one country is becoming more influential at global level the other country may not like that so you know yeah. and you have yeah. thank you so uh, uh, dr bijoy we have actually four uh, questions one from okay. angela she asked that in your opinion how is health and safety working in india like the workforce what how is uh in your opinion how is health and safety working in india health and safety i think that is the question in, in the world yes india yeah okay i think you know health and safety issues are uh, basically you know uh, the ilo has given guidelines very clearly for all the organizations what are the protocols what are the standards to be implemented how the working atmosphere has to be there and all at the same time the organization must get their license permission and everything because even you know for example in canada if you are doing a starting a business or starting an organization there are protocols standard protocols you know you have to talk to wsib you have to follow the regulatory regulations and all even in india there are occupational health and safety regulations but again you know it comes to the point you know how they are being implemented who is actually supervising whether there is a again you know there are there is a promptness in that whether people are trying to take shortcuts and avoid that or you know they are managing so i think you know the protocols or guidelines are there for all countries irrespective of not just india even in africa everywhere in the world it all just depends there is no standard answer that this is good or bad it all depends on the particular institute or organization how they are implementing those policies yeah i have another question for shanas i think it's a very long question but if you can answer that briefly then i think we can cover other questions too sure, so sure, she yeah. so she she according to her thank you so much for the points you mentioned it has been mentioned in your discussion that the personal or group interest of some governments that have political influence and high power in official dis- uh decision in international forum prevent the current implementation of program okay. and laws on the other hand considering the lobbies and interest groups can influence policies related to climate change how do you think government should deal with such measures against environmental and climate policies yeah hi sanas yeah you know she is my collaborator from iran and you know we did some papers together so i think you know uh this one actually you know uh, like i said you know we should not be biased we should not really i am not trying to say that civil society uh, must be the or the groups must really go with their agenda and make noise and at the same time i'm not telling that the government should, uh, should actually you know ignore their voices also i would say you know we should go with the evidence scientific evidence that's why you know the ipc the uh, you know uh, the uh, ipcc uh, which was established as a neutral body is not part of unfccc but then you know, it gives the clear cut picture like what is a burden what are the projections how to think it's not a uh, you know uh, something that is you know making people panic so in that way i think you know when we look at the scientific evidence and when we look at the current burden in their particular country definitely genuinely the society or the community will take those measures that you know it is a they will raise their voice within the country and that voices will join together at global level meaning that there is really something bad happening or something unwanted that is happening or the governments are silent let's say you know they are giving permissions to all these companies and factories without proper checks proper uh, without affecting the env- environmental impact assessments and all that 
So in a way, I think, you know, it is complex, but you know, you can't take one side. I would say better, you know, we go with the scientific evidence that is available and, you know, uh, yeah. first deal that with the negotiation within the government and take it to next level. Yeah. yeah th thank you, Dr. Bijoy. We have a, another question from Darren. Uh, she said, thank you for sharing another excellent presentation. How do you ensure that transitional organization in charge with the management of climate related issues, centralized equity, SIDS are most vulnerable and contributed less to the problem? How do you ensure that protective mechanism are in place? If you can answer that very shortly, that yes, will be yeah, I think, you know, Darren just came from Ireland because he attended a conference on disaster risk management. So I think, yeah. So, um, well, you know, the transition organizations are always uh, highly influential. Basically, you know, you have, they have a big lobbies. And sometimes on these organizations, actually they can influence the governments. They are more powerful than many of the uh, governments of Global South. So in that way, I think, you know, um, well, you know, equity issues, well, to be frank, you know, even the Barbados Prime Minister have highlighted and even in UNGA, she clearly mentioned that, you know, because of all the nations elsewhere doing their businesses and all everything, the small island developing countries or states are being actually the worst victims. So that is true in the sense, you know, I mean, you know, they are paying the price because you see, you can see the coastlines are going off and, you know, you, you, the temperatures are very high and they are not getting their natural foods. They can't grow. Away. Many of the islands are un, uninhabitable. So I think, you know, definitely uh, there must be measures, you know, where that's the reason why you need to have climate diplomacy and global health diplomacy, not with vested interests to support one particular transition or to make one country dominate the discussion. That's the reason why, you know, if you see in COP26 or in COP in generally, you have more voices coming from the civil society. Because of that, you know, you see the government's bending. Because of that, you know, you see proper, you know, agreements are being made. Even though some countries are not signing, immediately there's a big group coming on road protesting against and all. So I think, you know, the voice must be raised again, these uh, inequities, and I, I support that actually. Yeah. Thank you. I hope Darren got his answer. So I have a last question from Yasir. Uh, he is really uh, you know, interested to know if the uh, activities at the nexus of climate and health are primarily hosted by World Health Organization, such as WHO or climate bodies, who is in charge? Well, you know, well, can I answer that in one word, I think. Technically, you know, it is UNFCCC. Uh, you know, so uh, they will be doing that. Uh, but, you know, WHO will be contributing definitely because it is focusing on sustainable health systems, which are climate resilient. Uh, you have, you know, other bodies, let's say, you know, um, UNEP doing its part. You have United Nations, um, UNITAR doing its part through advocacy, through trainings, through these seminars, let's say. You have UNUs also, you know, working on different sustainability models, applying technology, how to have, you know, uh, you know, eco-friendly technologies using solar and all that. So, you know, there is, it is not like, you know, like I mentioned, uh, WHO technical agency for health, but, you know, if you look at the climate change, there are many partners here, but, you know, we can take, take UNFCCC as a technical body, but you have many players doing, everyone has to contribute because, you know, like I said, it joins, it combines all the sustainable development goals. So in a way, you know, uh, uh, it is very big. The more, the more you try to uh, include, I think, you know, I think technically you can say UNFCCC, that's the body. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Dr. Bijoy. Uh, so let me recap uh, your presentation. Uh, I think from your presentation, Dr. Bijoy, it is uh, very much clear that addressing climate change and global health challenges uh, require a comprehensive and collective approach by combining efforts through global health diplomacy, I think, and then climate diplomacy. And countries can effectively govern and uh, mitigate the impact of climate change while safeguarding public health, fostering equity, and promoting sustainable development. I think from your uh, presentation, it is very clear. Now I would like to you know, uh, request uh, uh, Dr. Ali Ashgari, uh, Professor Ali Ashgari, Director of CFAL, for his um, uh, closing remarks. Professor Ali Asghari, please. Professor Ali, are you here? I think he might not be, um, might not be available right now. Uh, well, uh, then um, uh, maybe I can <laughs> you know, put some concluding remark. 
Uh, again, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bijoy, for your excellent uh, presentation. And I would like to thank all the participants uh, uh, to participate in this uh, session and also take part in the question and answer session. Thank you very much, Dr. Vijay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone who all participated. And you know, you all have a nice day and good night. Thank you very much. Bye. Yep. And uh, just on behalf of CFA York, I could I'll also thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Chatu, for the great presentation and Dr. Talukter for moderating. And thank you to everybody who attended. Um, and I will just really quickly share my screen to show our next session that is coming up um, in two weeks from today on Wednesday, June 7th, it will be Dr. Telekter presenting on climate change related occupational health impacts on farmers and resulting consequences. Um, so uh, if that topic interests you, save that on your calendar. Um, and as always, today's session is being recorded and will be available within the next few hours uh, to view on our YouTube channel and on the event page here. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Thank you very much for your update. Thank, Thank you. you.